Okay, so if you don't mind, why don't we dedicate just one more episode to testing uh, so that we can get you reasonably comfortable with, um, if not the, the workflow, the general approach and what you can expect and what it looks like. Um, because here's the deal. In reality, testing is its own world. You know what I mean? Like everything in programming, you learn something new and you very quickly realize, oh, this is its own world. And there are conferences dedicated to this one thing. This one piece of the programming puzzle has its own conferences. So yeah, if you want to be frank, we could dedicate course after course after course after course to teaching you the uh, the ins and the outs and the, and the nuts and bolts of testing. And we just don't have time for that. And it's beyond the scope of a beginner series like this. But yeah, nonetheless, I do want to give you one more episode where we discuss everything from, you know, the the general approach, the different styles of testing, what you can expect, what it looks like, all of that stuff. Okay, let's get going. Yeah, of course, in the last episode near the end, we installed PEST, and we now have this new test directory. And I want you to notice how it's categorized into these different uh, styles of testing. One is called feature, and one is called unit. Um, you know, these days, I'm not even sure if it's if it's that useful to categorize things in this way. But nonetheless, it's good to understand the basic idea. Unit represents, well, uh, one unit of your code base. That unit could be a single class, a single function, or a small collection of classes. But still notice how they, they comprise a single, small, typically, uh, unit. On the other hand, feature test refers to something much wider, uh, a feature in your application. That feature could be, um, what would be an example from Laracas? Oh, he here's one. Uh, I just built a referral system for Laracas. That's a feature. So we could have a feature test called referral test. And within there, I can describe the, the rules of a referral system. What does it consist of? What are you allowed to do? What are you not allowed to do? So from that perspective, we might realize that when we write tests, it's not just to ensure the thing works, even though that's very useful. Uh, but it's, it's also almost like a scratch pad. It's a great way to gather your thoughts. For example, Let's go into example test here and rename this to referral test. We're not going to build this out, uh, but just to give you an idea of the approach, you might begin by writing the various features as tests. So we might have something like, uh, and by the way, we can use this test function or it. Uh, they are aliases. Use whichever one best fits uh, your, your description for the feature. So for example, um, it allows subscribers to earn money by referring their friends. Okay, so yeah, this, in this case, this is very top level, very um, zoomed out, but still, it would be a fine test to write. And it, it might be fairly in depth. Uh, for example, you might write the test uh, in such a way where you create a user, you sign the user in, you generate a referral code for that user, and then you um, create another user who redeems that referral code. And when they do redeem that code, and by the way, maybe when we speak it out and we describe it here, we realize, oh, redeem is a good verb, and that should be referenced or represented uh, in the code base somewhere. So maybe if you have a referral uh, class, then maybe you have a method called redeem. So again, this is what I mean when I say it's almost like a scratch pad. It gives us a way to gather our thoughts and then start identifying uh, patterns or keywords that we can then work into the code base. So yeah, on that note, I think in general, you'll find that uh, the testing community sort of splits into two. There are those who see testing as nothing more than a uh, necessity to ensure that the thing actually works. And they're right. Uh, but then there's another group who strongly feel that the way you approach your tests will help determine the design of your application. So from that perspective, the testing um, influences the design of the code base. And they're right too. So as, uh, as with almost everything in my life. There are good points on both sides of the equation. And my recommendation to you is don't worry about it. Uh, learn what you can and then discard it all and just make it work for you. So for example, if writing these tests before your implementation code just doesn't work for you, no matter how hard you try, don't do it. 
And by the way, that's referred to as test first development or test driven development. Uh, on the other hand, you might find situations where it makes sense in this context, but not in that it's too hard to, to wrap your mind around the flow. But over here, it makes perfect sense because you have uh, explicit input and output expectations. It doesn't matter. There's no rules. The only rule is that you make this work for you. Okay, so yeah, you have a good idea now of what a feature test might look like. And trust me, there are uh, there is dedicated tooling to assist with this. Because right now you're probably thinking, well, how do I visit a page from a test? How do I fill out a form from a test? And the answer is, well, you could write it yourself, but it is so much work. Uh, I wrote a little framework many, many years ago to help with this. And yeah, it, it's a massive amount of work. And again, beyond the scope of uh, of this video or this entire series, to be frank. Uh, but but as with anything, there is dedicated tooling across the board. There are tools like Dusk. Uh, there are tools like Browser Test. Uh, there are on uh, JavaScript tools that literally open the browser and interact with your website, like Cypress. All of them are really useful. And uh, as you as you become more comfortable, I would encourage you to check those out. But yeah, for now. Just understand the general idea of what you might want to test. So on that note, you might also say it disallows guests from participating in the referral program. So yeah, maybe you've decided, uh, like I have, if you don't have a Lyricast account, um, we're not going to let you participate in, in the referral system. Maybe it's just too difficult, or maybe we need you to hook up your... Uh, your billing details, it doesn't matter. You decide what the rules are for your code base and your feature, and then you write them out, and then you write the test to ensure that it does what you expect. Okay, cool. Uh, next, we have this container test that we worked on in the last episode, which is, this is an incredibly real world. Uh, this represents a simple unit test that we can resolve something out of the container. But now, do we have anything else we might want to work on here? Um, we could test some middleware. We could test the validator. These are really just simple static functions. But you know what? Uh, I think this would make sense. So let's give it a shot. Uh, let's create a new test. And we're going to call it validator test.php. All right. So why don't we say it validates a string? All right. So let's pull in our class. We're going to call the string method. And you'll remember if we quickly uh, switch back, we give it the value and then an optional minimum and maximum uh, character count. Okay, so let's switch back and we'll say foobar. Okay, so if we run this, should this be valid? Is foobar a string? Absolutely. So let's save that to results and then say expect result to be true. So I could do this or I could use the method to be true. All right, let's give it a run. So uh, I could do it directly from my editor because I'm using PHP Storm. And really, most editors these days will have some kind of inline support. But yeah, for now, let's just do it directly from the terminal. So I will run pest on the test unit validator test. And of course, it returns green. OK, now I'll give you a little tip, though. Let's do this. Let's inline this variable entirely. And we could do another one. So for example, if I said false, I would expect that to be false. And if we give it a run, we are we already know that's going to work. Let's do another one. And this time, why don't we feed it an empty string? And that should return false because it's empty. Give it a run, and that works. OK, um, we could add another one here. And we'll clean this up and refactor shortly. It validates a string with a minimum uh, length. So for example, if I run this, but I say uh, the minimum length should be 20 characters, well, in this case, foobar is not 20 characters, so I expect that to return false. We give it a run, and that works. OK, this is exactly what we want. And notice how it's just proving our expectations, our assumptions, and that's the entire point. So whether we wrote this implementation code before or after, again, it doesn't really matter. Maybe it's a personality thing. Do whatever you want. Um, I find I kind of do both. Uh, there, there are certain situations, honestly, like this, uh, I would write the test first before the implementation code. But then there's other situations where, I don't know, it doesn't really work for me. I feel like I have to spike it out a little. And in those cases, I'll write some uh, implementation code first, and then I will backfill or fill it in uh, with some tests. Both work. It doesn't matter. Do what you want. Okay, cool. Let's do another one for email, and then we'll clean things up. So we'll say it validates... 
uh, an email. All right, so if I call email with foobar, I will expect that to not be valid. Give it a run, it works. If I give it a actual email address or a dummy email address, in that case, it should return true. Give it a run and oh, it doesn't work. Failed asserting that foobar is true. Yes, of course. So already the test is informing us that our assumptions aren't exactly uh, what the code says. So in this case, I was assuming it returns a Boolean, but, in t uh, but I'm sorry, but instead it returns either false if it is not an email address or the value if it is. So now we have to decide, are we okay with that? Or do we always want it to return a Boolean? So for example, do we want to force it to be a Boolean? Well, if we take that, I think it'll fix it. And yeah, that does solve the problem. But again, this is a decision that you have to make. Does validate email return a Boolean or does it return false or the email itself? You have to decide that. Uh, and a quick note, we haven't talked about this very much, but uh, you can leverage types to be a little more explicit about uh, the, the, the types of input that you expect. And again, we haven't talked about this very much because uh, it's not a high level topic, but only because I think there is a beauty in teaching the basics of PHP in a very dynamic uh, way. That's the way I learned it. And I feel like it's just easier to grasp when you are not constantly throwing syntax uh, at the viewer, at the person who's trying to figure out how all of this works. But nonetheless, it can be incredibly useful. So a quick little 30 second primer. Um, if I want to be explicit that this parameter should be of type string, then I could write string here. And now if we were to call this email method and feed it an array or an object or a class or something like that, it's going to fail and it will let you know, hey, you gave us an array, but we thought you were going to give us a string and we expected you to give us a string. So maybe you need to take a look at this. Okay, and then we can also do return types represented by a colon and then the uh, the type. So in this case, if I want a Boolean, and actually take a look at this. So real quick, without the type, if we give it a run, it fails because uh, we're expecting a Boolean in response. So one fix was to manually cast it like this, and that works. However, another option is to declare a return type of a Boolean. So now notice if I run it, that fixes the problem too. So this is teaching us that when we declare a return type, if what we return doesn't match that type, it will automatically be cast in the best way possible to become that type. Um, you can disable that if you want, if you want to be a little more strict, uh, but nonetheless, it is an option that you might consider. So in situations like this, this uh, and this, are redundant and you still might want to keep that redundancy, but nonetheless, it's not altogether uh, necessary. Okay, small little tangent. If you wanna learn more about types, definitely do so, but that's the extent uh, that we will cover in this series. But maybe in a follow-up series, we will dedicate the entire thing to discussing types in PHP and the pros and the cons and the benefits. And um, um, I'm repeating myself at this point. Let's keep going. So now why don't we wrap up by maybe doing one more. So let's do this. Let's go ahead and import this at the top and that way we can simplify these. And why don't we validate, um, I don't know, uh, it validates that a number is greater than um, a given amount or something like that. So we could say greater than, and we'll say uh, we need to give it the value. So maybe the value is 10 and we expect that to be greater than uh, one. Well, if we run that, that should return true. Okay, so let's do this. I'm gonna call this method only using pest. And that declares that, well, you can skip all of these right now. I'm only interested in this one test alone. So we give it a run and notice uh, we only have one test here and it failed, of course. Call to undefined method validator greater than. Okay, so now we're taking a test first approach. We're seeing a test failure and that is guiding us uh, to write implementation code. So let's do that now. We go into the validator. I create a new uh, static method and we're gonna call this greater than. This will accept and we'll add a type this time, a value and then a greater than amount. And that will be an integer. Okay, 
Let's give it a run. Now it's still going to fail, but we should change uh, the failure message. And again, this is sort of a cornerstone, a, a bullet point of test first development. You want to make that error message change. So even though you're getting red, if you can change the error message, uh, ideally you're making progress. And that's the case here. All right, so now the method name exists, but it's returning null when we expected true to be returned. Okay, so let's do this. Let's be clear that we want a Boolean in response. And why don't we just check to see uh, if value, and I'm sorry, this should be an integer, of course, you caught that. Uh, this should check if value is greater than uh, what we have here. All right, we give that a run. It works. But now let's just sort of prove our assertion. So if I come back here, because he, he, here's the problem, and you want to be careful about this. Maybe you just return true here instead, and that still returns green. So we have to be careful of trusting the test too much. Uh, sometimes you can have uh, all green on your test suite, but the code base doesn't work because, well, it's not doing what you thought it would. So let's add uh, one more test here and say, well, uh, in what condition should that return false? Well, how about something like this. Is 10 greater than 100? No. So that should return false. It's kind of a silly example, but nonetheless, it shows you the basic approach. Okay, so if I come back now, if we did that superfluous thing where we hard-coded true, the tests are going to inform us, uh-uh, that's not working. There's no way uh, that satisfies both of these uh, expectations. So now we can write the real code run it again, and it returns green. And yeah, as simple as this dummy little example is, it sort of represents the general flow. So if you'd like to keep working on this, yeah, on your own, just pick one of these files that we have here and write some tests for it. Uh, start simple. How about, yeah, we can force log in a user. So what you would do is you would write a test and you'd give it a descriptive name. And then you would instantiate the authenticator, you would call the login method, you would feed it a user, and then in response, you would assert that, well, there should be user in the session. So actually look into the session and confirm, is that uh, equal to what we expect here? And if it's not, you know you did something wrong. Okay, and yeah, you know what? Why don't we end it there? Uh, originally, I was thinking of doing two episodes, but I'm very worried about overwhelming you. And maybe that ship has long since sailed. Uh, the truth is, right now in your learning, if you want to skate by it and kind of ignore it for a bit, that's okay. Just keep in mind, though, once you start building real projects that others depend on and make use of, it's really a necessity. So be sure to consider it when you feel comfortable. All right, I'll see you in the next chapter.